Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Virtual Hammer Museum, coming to you live from Los Angeles. I'm Claudia Bester. I'm the director of the Hammer's Public Programs, and I'm really pleased to welcome you to today's Hammer Forum on last week's insurrection at the Capitol Building in DC and yesterday's impeachment. The Hammer Forum is a series of public discussions about current social and political issues, and it's made possible with support from the Rosenblum family. Now, I have just a couple of quick notes before the audience before we start. Um, this program is being recorded and will be available later on the Hammer website. It's being conducted via Zoom webinar, so we can see your names and anything you type into the chat or the Q&A boxes. We'd love for you all to introduce yourselves in the chat box and feel free to talk with each other there. And the Q&A box is where you type in questions you have specifically for the panelists. So now on to our program. As you all know, there was a violent mob that penetrated the Capitol building last week during the counting of the Electoral College votes. Since then, a lot has happened, including the impeachment of the president for incitement of insurrection. Tonight, we have two members of Congress with us here. Both of them were in the Capitol building during the insurrection, and both are trained lawyers. So we've asked them to join the Hammer Forum tonight to give us their firsthand accounts of what happened and to help us make sense of it all. I don't know about you all, but the news has been coming at me like a completely overwhelming fire hose. So we're going to try and set up a framework for processing all of this using the law as a means of making sense of it all. So today we will, among other things, discuss what laws apply to the president and to the insurrectionists. The Honorable Nanette Baragan has served as the congressperson for California's 44th district in the U.S. House of Representatives since 2017. Her district includes South Los Angeles and the LA Harbor region. She grew up in Harbor City, California and earned a BA from, in political science um, right here at UCLA and her law degree from USC. Prior to law school, she worked in the office of the public liaison for the Clinton administration and for the NAACP. After law school, she served under California Supreme Court um, Justice Carlos Moreno and later at the Los Angeles Legal Aid Foundation and at the United States Attorney's Office for the Central District of California. And she served on the Hermosa Beach City Council from 2013 to 2015. Congressperson Ted Liu represents California's 33rd district in the US House of Representatives, which includes West LA and the South Bay from Malibu to Palos Verdes. He has been all over the news in the past week because he was one of the people managing yesterday's impeachment of President Trump. Lou also serves on the House Judiciary Committee and the House Foreign Affairs Committee. He previously served in the JAG Corps of the United States Air Force. And I should say he is an epic force on Twitter. So if you don't follow him yet, check him out. Our moderator tonight is Loyola Law School Professor Jessica Levinson. Levinson studies the law of the political process, including election law and governance issues. Her work focuses on ethics, political corruption, voting rights, campaign finance, ballot initiatives, redistricting, term limits, and state budgets. She regularly appears as a legal and political expert in television and radio and in print. She's the host of the new podcast, Passing Judgment, and has a weekly legal segment on NPR member station KCRW here in Los Angeles. She's also an op-ed contributor for NBC.com and the associate director of Loyola's Journalist Law School. Professor Levinson served as the president of the Los Angeles Ethics Commission until 2018, and she's the founding director of Loyola Law School's Public Service Institute, which is dedicated to creating the next generation of leaders in government service. So hello to all of you and welcome representatives Nanette Baragan, Ted Liu, and Jessica Levinson. Hi, everybody. It's I say this every time, but it's great to see so many familiar faces in the attendees, uh, so many familiar names, excuse me, in the attendees' names. Um, and I'm so honored that we have two members of Congress here with us today. Um, Congresswoman uh, Barragan and I met in a Zoom room during the insurrection. We were on TV together and I basically said, hey, I think we might do this hammer form, so you should really, <laughs> uh, you should do it. And um, Congressman Lou and I met about a decade ago, uh, I think when you were running for the state legislature and you've always been um, a wonderful friend and a great friend of Loyal Law School as well. So I know this has been a difficult um, news week for a lot of us and I wanna start maybe with a little bit of levity but I think it will bring us into the conversation. And so that starts with you, Congressman Liu. Um, I think maybe the most epic correction of 2021 came this morning, uh, one of my friends texted it to me right away. What is the difference between a crowbar and a 
crowbar and why does this matter for the insurrection? Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Professor Levinson, for your question. Uh, before before I answer that, let me just first say what's an honor it is for me to be on this panel with Congresswoman Barragon. Uh, she uh, has done amazing work in Congress and I look forward to serving with her uh, this term. And Professor Levinson, I'm going to be on with you. As many of you know, uh, she is brilliant, which is why uh, it's sort of funny that about a year ago, I called up Professor Levinson because I had some questions about the Ukraine impeachment. And now on to the second impeachment. Uh, so in terms of the question you asked, uh, I had given an interview to a, a reporter over the phone, sort of asking me um, what happened that day, sort of at the very beginning. And I said, well, I was you know, in my office and the Capitol Hill police started banging on the doors and they banged on our, on our door. And then we opened it and they told us to evacuate immediately. So I said, I uh, grabbed a crowbar and uh, raced down uh, five flights of steps. And the reporter, when he wrote the story, um, thought I meant one of those crowbars uh, that uh, actually is quite, would be quite useful in an attempted coup. Uh, but actually what I did was I got, got a crowbar energy bar and he had misheard it. But it's sort of interesting that uh, he had assumed I would have a crowbar to fight off uh, this mob. And that to him seemed much more realistic because uh, we're in this strange time where you had an actual attack on our nation's capital uh, by a mob intending on hurting members of Congress. I mean, it is actually quite a significant statement that a member of the press assumes that you have a crowbar in your office. Um, Congresswoman Barragan, I know what you did for part of the day because we spent about 20 minutes together. Um, right. Can you walk me through a little bit more of that day for you? How did it begin? Where was the moment when you thought, okay, th things are going south here? Well, it was really scary. Um, I was actually supposed to be on the house floor at 2 p.m. and was running late. So I was in an adjacent building and I was about to head to the floor when I was told to stop because they were evacuating uh, one of the nearby office buildings. And uh, shortly thereafter, I heard on the intercom system, the uh, basically the sirens and then saying we were sheltered in place. And in my four years in Congress, I've never even heard anybody come over that loudspeaker before so that was, I think, pretty shocking. But when you turn the television on, because I couldn't see, um, when I turned on the TV and I saw the images of these rioters inside of the Capitol, that's when the panic set in because our offices are connected by tunnels to the Capitol. And when I would hear somebody coming down the hallway, I didn't know if it was rioters or if it was staff and so it was a scary, it was a scary time. And we were given some updates via text message and they just said that the building is not secure and there was still a threat. And so the entire time um, we you would just barricade our, our doors and really not know um, what, besides what we were seeing on TV or what we could see outside the window of our office, but there is no window we could see from our office um, into the hallways. And so it was it was just a scary day. And certainly I'm um, seeing the images of my colleagues, you know, on the house floor, putting on the gas mask um, was pretty horrifying. I, I remember Congresswoman, we had a very quick conversation where you said they told us to open up for security, but how do I know if it's security? Which really is terrible echoes of, I mean, Nancy Pelosi said this, I think today that my young staffers knew exactly what to do because they've all had shelter in place drills for their entire life in case there is a school, um, a school shooting. So um, Congressman Liu, could you help us? I know that you're going to play a large role in the impeachment. And could you tell us what that role is, and could you briefly help us define some of the terms that we need to know here? So what is incitement? Uh, so uh, thank you for that question. Uh, so Speaker Pelosi selected me as one of the nine impeachment managers. So we will basically prosecute the trial in the U.S. Senate, and we hope to get a conviction uh, as of right now, Donald Trump has been impeached. And so he's the first 
the US president had been impeached twice by the House of Representatives. And the next step would be uh, the trial uh, in the Senate. And the article of impeachment is called incitement to insurrection. It's very clear what happened that day. We had a mob attack the Capitol with intent of stopping Congress from accepting the certified electoral college results, which would have formalized Donald Trump's defeat and Joe Biden's win. During that mob attack, a number of people died, including uh, a police officer. And the person that incited it was Donald Trump. And what incitement means is that he essentially took actions uh, or uh, made statements that uh, whipped up this mob uh, to attack the Capitol, uh, that uh, encouraged them to attack the Capitol. And if you look at his speech, the, the transcripts are available. You can view that, you can just watch his video. It's pretty long, it's about an hour. Um, you do get a sense he's mentally not well when you listen to that speech, but he made a number of pretty inflammatory statements. Uh, he basically said that this election was stolen. He told his supporters to stop the steal. He told them uh, to march down Pennsylvania Avenue. He told them uh, that they'll never take their uh, country back uh, by showing weakness. He told them to show strength. He told them to fight like hell. He told them that Mike Pence could change the result by simply not agreeing to the certification, essentially. Um, and so when you sort of put all this together, it's very clear he was directing his folks to go and intervene uh, in what Congress was doing that day, and they listened to him, and that's what they did. Um, Congressman Liu, I have one follow-up question, and then I want to go to uh, Congresswoman Berrigan for the timing of this. Um, I have heard, and I, I know what I think I know what your response is going to be, but and you've likely heard the criticism of the president was engaging in protected First Amendment speech. When it comes to the First Amendment, the pinnacle of what we want to protect is political speech. And it's not proper to punish somebody for that. Can you explain to us um, what the problem with that argument is? Sure, so there's, there's uh, at least two problems. One is everyone knows you can't right, yell fire in a crowded movie theater. Um, the First Amendment doesn't say you can say whatever you want in any context at any time. Uh, so there are exceptions to it. But second, this is about presidential conduct. This is not about your ordinary American who is trying to get people to march down Pennsylvania Avenue to protest Congress. Uh, Congressman Barragan and I see numerous protests all the time um, in DC uh, against Congress and, and, and against the White House and, and Capitol Hill and so on. Uh, this is about presidential conduct and the president's words matter. And it wasn't just his single speech. For two months, he had been whipping up his supporters in a frenzy that he won by landslide, that Joe Biden stole the election, that Donald Trump is a legitimate president, and that he was going to basically remain president through any means necessary, including uh, by force. And so there is a felony statute called incitement to insurrection. Uh, you just can't do that. And it's not um, an issue of the First Amendment, it's an issue of presidential conduct. Absolutely. And as we know from having lived through two impeachments in this particular term, you don't actually have to prove that somebody committed a crime in order to impeach them. That's what happens most of the time, but you wouldn't even have to rise to the level of showing uh, that you advocated for immediate and lawless harm and that you intended for immediate and lawless harm to occur. Um, Congresswoman Berrigan, we, I'm gonna ask you a similar question, which is to respond to an argument that I hear a lot, I'm sure you hear a lot, which is um, we've got six more days of this term. This is divisive. Let's just heal the country. Everybody should come back together. We're already so polarized. What's the point in having this fight? He's, if the part of the point of impeachment is removal, he'll be removed before the trial even starts. Well, let me start by saying that this was the most bipartisan vote in the history of Congress to impeach a president where you had 10 Republicans, including the number three Republican, uh, Liz Cheney uh, join in 
this. Why? Um, because number one, you can't allow a president to have this kind of behavior, basically violate his oath of office and violate the constitution. It's only gonna invite uh, future folks to do this um, and other elected officials or future presidents possibly to do this. So there's gotta be consequences. That's the first one. Um, but this president is a danger to our country. We frankly don't know what he can do or what he might do between now and inauguration. It's the House has done its job. If the Senate Republicans decide not to take this up and something happens, this is gonna be on them. And so we have to take action. We did our constitutional duty. We, took, we did our duty that we have here in the House. And so we really need the Senate to act. Um, the other thing is that um, I, I can't stress enough of how if we focus on the comments uh, from our Republican colleagues on why this was necessary, um, they, they also uh, just tell us about um, the, the duty that they feel that they had to do and to, to stop a future president. Um, now, if he's convicted, it's also possible um, that this president will not be able to run for office again. Um, and so that is certainly something that be, can, can be considered uh, regardless if he's out of office, regardless if the time has passed. And so that's, there's that consideration. Uh, but doing nothing is really not an option and holding people accountable is definitely necessary. And so um, I'm glad the house moved as quickly as it did. And I, I would just continue to urge uh, a Senator McConnell to uh, start an emergency session to consider uh, the impeachment trial right away. Uh I had a quick follow-up for Congressman Lou, so uh, Congresswoman Berrigan, I'll have a quick follow-up for you just because I, I heard you say something that maybe I haven't fully considered and maybe the audience hasn't either. I had assumed that the Senate would take this up for the reason that during the first impeachment, there was this discussion of, well, maybe you can just slow walk it to the Senate or they can never take it up. And Senator McConnell basically said, no, I understand there has to be something that happens. Um, now, look, it could be 15 minutes, but my understanding is that he basically said, I know it's incumbent upon us that if there is an impeachment, we have to do something. Is there now chatter that maybe the Senate won't take it up at all? Or did I take too much from your comment? I, I think that I haven't heard any chatter that the Senator McConnell is going to call an emergency session. The last that I've seen is that he was going to wait to do it uh, either the day before the inauguration or on inauguration. Um, so that's just uh, really unfortunate if he sticks to that. Um, but you know, this president uh, needs to be tried for what he did. And I have seen some art, some opinions out there, uh, some editorials, I should say. Uh, with some people who believe he can't be tried after he leaves office, but my understanding is that he can be um, and that he should be. Yeah, I think, well, you know, there, look, there's three lawyers on this Zoom, and I think we probably all agree, but typically you put three lawyers in a room and then you can get three different opinions. There's the one opinion, which I think is wrong, that you have to have the impeachment and the trial during the term. Another, the kind of middle, you have to have the impeachment during the term, but the trial can happen after. And then the third, that everything can happen after. Um, Congressman Liu, do you, do you have a sense of timing of the impeachment trial? And um, I have a quick follow-up for you after, but it, is this going to be January 21st? Will it be right after the inauguration? Uh, so we're asking Senator McConnell to uh, bring the Senate back and to hold the trial. Uh, so let's just ask this simple question. Uh, what really important thing is the Senate doing right now? Nothing. They're at home. There's nothing preventing them from coming back on Monday and starting the trial. So we're urging that that uh, happens. Uh, if not, what's going to happen is Senator Schumer will become Senate leader essentially on January 20th because that's when Vice President-elect Kamala Harris becomes our nation's first uh, female black and Asian vice president, and she breaks ties in the Senate. So Democrats gain control on that day. And then Senator Schumer is leader. And under him, he will set when the trial happens. And 
I would expect that he would have it happen as soon as possible. Um, so that is the impeachment. And I just want to, I saw a couple of questions come in. Um, I want to move on to the 25th Amendment, but quickly to answer those questions, impeachment uh, just means the, the House has said, not just, but this is a major issue, that the House has said, Senate, there's enough, go forward. The president still has pardon power, which we can talk about uh, later. The president, frankly, has every power of office. Um, there's no legal consequence that he's prevented from doing anything at this moment. I saw a couple of questions um, come in about this. And uh, just to clarify, the Senate, of course, has to convict by a supermajority, which would mean two thirds, 67 senators. Senator Mitch McConnell, um, well, I'm going to actually ask you about this, uh, Senator Byer again. We've seen Senator Mitch McConnell uh, go from calling the first impeachment a charade to in this time saying, you know, I'll go ahead and keep um, an open mind when it comes to this. Is a is this an open mind or he's he already you think made up his mind either way and how how consequential is that well i think it's it's huge um but we don't really know you know senator mcconnell uh, uses his words uh wisely and you know report reports are that this may be a way to get trump you know off of the radar per se um and he, maybe he wants to appear like he's going to have an open mind now certainly we've seen republicans that were willing to stand for democracy and the constitution in the house that we're willing to vote to impeach. Um, so this, this could be, you know, you know his way of uh, just trying to appease some folks. Um, what I hope doesn't happen is that when the trial does happen, if he doesn't get this done before the inauguration is that he says, Oh, well, he's out of office there. I'm not going to, you know, convict. And that's what, you know, some people are suggesting could be the case. Um, he plays politics very well. And in this case, it really shouldn't be about politics. It should be about the constitution, our democracy and doing what's right. And so um, I have to just continue to, to be hopeful as I can that he really is keeping an open mind. He's gonna really consider um, convicting this president because after our impeachment managers and Ted Lieu make the case, um, I feel confident that uh, the facts and the evidence is there to do that. Well, right. And so for impeachment, for, excuse me, conviction, you would need that supermajority. You would need all Democrats and 17 Republicans. But then for the sentence, you just need a simple, my understanding is you just need a simple majority of the Senate. And the sentence for impeachment can be two things. One, you're removed from office, which really I think already will have happened. Or two, you can't run again. Um, Congressman Liu, a similar question to you before we move on to the 25th Amendment. How much of this hinges on Senator Mitch McConnell? Is he signaling to the other Republican senators, it's okay, nothing will happen if you vote to convict? And could that, you think, be enough to get 16 other senators? Uh, that's a great point. I think it could be enough. We already have now seen uh, Senator Murkowski come out today and basically say that she believed what the House did with impeachment was appropriate. Um, and we have Senator Ben Sass say that he's open to impeachment. We have Senator Pat Toomey say something similar, that he's open to impeachment. So you have a number of senators on the Republican side that uh, have either um, said with the House that was appropriate or said they're open to impeachment, including Senator McConnell. So this is very different than a first impeachment. And I think uh, there is a, a shot at conviction and we're going to present the best case that we can. Well, it, and it seems to me that this impeachment is kind of substantively different because it took more than a few sentences to try and explain the first one. Um, and now actually, Congressman Liu, I, I just blatantly lied to you. This is, that was not the last question when it comes to the impeachment. Before we leave, and I'm sorry, I'm trying to woman the Q&A and the chat and think about uh, where we should go at the same time. When was the first moment that you thought, yes, impeachment, let's do this? So after we had um, raced on the five flights of stairs through the tunnels, um, we went to uh, sort of the next building over and we're hanging on the hallways and we didn't quite know why we were being evacuated at the time. So we started looking at our phones and it was pretty clear that a mob was descending on Capitol Hill. Uh, so instead of hanging on the hallways, uh, we decided to 
call my colleague, Congressman David Cicilline, um, and they said uh, they would graciously take us in. So we went to the Rayburn House office building through the tunnels. They let us in, they locked the door, and we proceeded to watch on TV in horror as events unfolded. Um, and at uh, some point, it just became clear to both Congressman Cicely and I that Donald Trump needs to be removed. It was very clear that he was essentially doing an attempted coup and we were in the middle of it. And so we started drafting uh, the article of impeachment. We worked remotely with Congressman uh, Jamie Raskin, who's also a constitutional law professor. And we, we worked remotely with the House Judiciary staff. And so while we were on lockdown, uh, we started writing uh, the article. The House can move quickly. Um, one way to remove a president is via impeachment. Another way, Congresswoman Berrigan, to remove a president is via the 25th Amendment. Um, the 25th Amendment, of course, says to the vice president, tell either get a majority of the cabinet or get a majority of some other legislative body to agree that the president is unable to fulfill the powers and duties of his office. Um, should this have been a route that we thought about taking? Would the 25th Amendment have had some benefits over the impeachment route? Absolutely. I think this is one of the reasons that the House moved to encourage the vice president to take, to take this route. The reality is for the 25th Amendment, um, it's, in, in, as Ted noted, when the president was speaking at the rally, you could see he was mentally not there. And that's what the 25th Amendment's for. You don't have the mental capacity. You're not fit to serve. The 25th Amendment takes politics out of it in the sense that it's your own cabinet. The folks that are loyal to you are making an assessment that you are not fit to serve. And so um, that would have been a route. It would have been the fastest route, I think. Um, and it would have definitely taken out, off this, taken out this argument that we're hearing now about unity and division because um, it would have showed uh, that the vice president was uh, you know, willing to see what we all saw and act on it, um, as we saw on, instead is uh, cabinet members who, who didn't agree or came to that assessment, decided they were going to resign instead of, uh, you know, trying to talk through it with the vice president um, and invoking the 25th Amendment. Um, Congressman Liu, is there a problem with the 25th Amendment that we see now and um, that should be fixed? Or is it luckily one of those things that we should, well, that we just don't have to think about that much because we haven't been in this position very often in our country? So on Wednesday, uh, when Donald Trump was impeached, I thought that was a very sad day for our country because we should never need to impeach our president and certainly never need to impeach the president twice. Uh, nor should we have to try to execute the 25th Amendment. Um, all of these options are designed uh, to essentially remove the President of the United States. And we don't really want to have these options executed because you, normally you don't want to remove the President of the United States. They're supposed to um, you know, be good presidents and do good things for American people. The 25th Amendment is uh, designed, as Congressman Berrigan said, for the president's cabinet and the vice president uh, to essentially execute that removal. And so on the House uh, floor on Tuesday, we did vote out legislation to essentially encourage Vice President Pence to do that. He declined. And that's why we went forward with the impeachment action uh, on Wednesday. Um, is it worth thinking about amending the 25th Amendment so that there's some way to pull the lever without going through the vice president. Uh, Congresswoman Berrigan, I can go to you first. Um, I don't know. I mean, we have the impeachment tool to use and I um, I guess I'd have to hear more arguments on it. My concern is, is you know, when you start making changes to, to some of these amendments, um, do then people take them and use them um, as political weapons. And I think that's the greater concern. I mean, we are seeing in Congress now, uh, you know, new members on the fringe who, uh, you know, it's just hard to believe that, you know, they're serving as members of Congress. And of course, now there's new security concerns about 
members worrying about other members. That's something I never thought of. When I got elected four years ago, I never dreamed of walking into the Capitol and being worried about whether one of my colleagues was going to be, uh, you know, a, a threat to me. So, so I just, I have, I, I'm hesitant. Um, and I'd have to kind of look at what the options are if we're going to make any changes to that. Um, do you walk into the Capitol and worry about your colleagues? Absolutely, we do now. We have uh, these new metal detectors that were put right outside of the House floor. And uh, unfortunately, our colleagues on the other side who always say they support law enforcement are pushing law enforcement aside, are not listening to them. Uh, they're, the, the metal detector will go off and they keep walking, ignoring, um, ignoring law enforcement. It's remarkable to see members of Congress act this way and disregard uh, the rules and law enforcement so much that the speaker is now uh, proposing that we vote on fines of $5,000 for, for the first incident. Uh, but that's because members are concerned when you have your colleagues making videos that they're packing heat and they're you know ready to use it. Um, and then you hear some of the language and rhetoric they use against other members. Um, I think it, it only raises the temperature. And so um, after what happened at the Capitol, uh, we are, um, we're on high alert and we're more concerned. I, it makes me sad to hear uh, colleagues on the other side, because I feel like I'm old enough to remember a time when it was, you know, my colleagues who had different views when it wasn't, um, when it wasn't like this. And I'm certainly not criticizing you for using the term. Um, Congressman Liu, I hadn't planned on asking either one of you about this, but do you go to work uh, fearing for your safety when it comes to uh, some of your colleagues. I mean, I I was going to ask about this at the end, but there have been some reports that the rioters um, may have had assistance from some of your colleagues. Do we know what's happening with those reports? And, and again, do you do you feel unsafe when you're in the Capitol? So about an hour ago, NBC News published this article. I'm just going to read you the headline. Some Democrats in Congress are worried their colleagues might kill them. So let's just think about that. NBC, major news network, published an article with that headline. And so we're in uncharted territory. Uh, you have some freshman members of the Republican caucus that neither Congresswoman Barragan uh, or I really have any idea about what they're like, because they're brand new. We've never really interacted with them. But based on their public statements and actions, it is rather frightening. Uh, and when you have Republican members of Congress simply evading metal, metal detectors, uh, or even worse, walking through metal detectors, setting them off, and then continue to keep on going to the House floor. Um, that does raise some very troubling issues, which is why we're going to pass a new rule that's going to impose a $5,000 fine for the first offense and then $10,000 fine for the second offense uh, directly out of the member's pocket. Uh, in addition, you had, uh, as we know, uh, during this lockdown, a number of Republican Democratic members uh, in a room for hours and the Republican members, uh, some of them wouldn't wear masks. And as a result of that, we now got four Democratic members that have tested positive for COVID uh, from that uh, same room. And so you have health concerns uh, because you still have Republican members who uh, will either violate the mask policy uh, or try to skirt around it. And you have these threats to both your health, uh, both because of the virus and because of potential sort of physical issues. And it is, it is a very um, disturbing area to, to go into right now at this moment in time. And Jessica, if I could just add something real quick, um, something I never thought I would be texting other colleagues about, you know, these text chains we have about who's gonna go get a bulletproof vest. I mean, I, I gotta tell you when that chain started, I was like, oh my gosh. And so now the house is allowing us to use part of our budget to get a bulletproof vest. And I gotta tell you, it's unsettling for me to think about having to wear a bulletproof vest, but that's where we are now with security. And, um, you know, members of Congress get a single ticket to the inauguration and most members are bringing a spouse. I had four people decline to come, four people because of concerns either about security or COVID. And this is generally a time where people are clamoring uh, to come to an inauguration. So it just kind of, I think it gives you a little bit of a taste of where we are right now. It's not a, it's not a good place. Um, 
I'm just hopeful that we can get through inauguration peacefully and we can uh, do what we need to do to, to move on and, um, and, and get back to, to some feeling of normalcy of coming to work at the Capitol. Right. And which of course is the people's house. I mean, that's a public place uh, for public servants. So it's, um, it's 540. I'm going to do what I usually do in class. Where have we been? We've talked about your experiences in the insurrection. We've talked about the impeachment and what is um, going to happen, you know, what we expect will happen. We've talked a little bit about the 25th Amendment. Again, Section 4 of the 25th Amendment has never been used in our nation's history. It allows for the involuntary removal of a president. Uh, it requires the vice president to pull the lever and say this person is no longer fit to fulfill the powers and duties of his office. But there is, Congressman Liu, a third constitutional provision, the 14th Amendment, that's being talked about. And the 14th Amendment, I think most people think of due process. They think of equal protection. They don't think of section three. Could you tell us a little bit about why this is in the news and why it might be used? Right. You know, uh, I can guarantee you that Congresswoman Barragan and I have learned so many things about the Constitution we were never taught of uh, because of Donald Trump's last four years. Uh, none of us ever learned about section three of the 14th Amendment. But basically uh, what it says, because we've all had to learn it pretty recently, is it says that you cannot hold office in the United States if you engage in an insurrection. And we also included that language uh, in the article of impeachment. We directly refer to section three of the 14th amendment as well. And that is absolutely an appropriate avenue to take not only to uh, try to remove Donald Trump immediately, but also other members of Congress. And so there is potentially, um, some members of Congress that help incite this insurrection. And if that's the case, I think we should look at whether their service is compatible with the 14th Amendment, Section 3. Um, there needs to be an investigation first, uh, and then depending on the facts of the investigation, we might very well uh, look at uh, executing Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. Uh, Congresswoman Berrigan, is this on the table for you, Section 3 of the 14th Amendment? Do you think that it might be applicable to some of your colleagues? I, I do, um, and I'm also on a resolution by uh, Cori Bush that she has on the 14th Amendment. And her resolution is uh, specific to health ethics and expelling members. But, you know, I think we need to consider all avenues, in, including criminal, uh, you know, liability. Because what happened, um, uh, just to remind folks, is five people died, uh, including, uh, you know, one police officer, uh, two police officers, you know, one where we don't. Um, know if it was the cause, the, the day of was the cause, but um, people died and uh, the vice president was at risk and the speaker was at risk. And let's not forget that something that my colleagues, uh, my Republican colleagues who, who joined the impeachment have also pointed out um, that we haven't heard enough of is uh, while this was happening, after the president incited the violence and it was happening, he didn't act to stop it. Um, and that also, you know, was um, for me, not just somebody who incited this insurrection, but was going along with it as it was occurring and no doing nothing to stop it, not using the resources to stop it. And um, that's a huge betrayal. So um, definitely on the table. Well, and of course, doing nothing actually is uh, an action. I mean, it enables things to happen. Um, Let me just add, add something yeah. real quick. Uh, Congresswoman Barron is right that he did nothing to stop it. Uh, he actually, in fact, also took actions um, that made it worse because during the riot, he actually sent out another tweet attacking Mike Pence after he had just given the whole speech in which part of it was saying how Mike Pence uh, could change the election result and essentially make Donald Trump president. Um, in addition, Donald Trump was calling senators during this attack not to ask about their safety, but ask him to delay the Electoral College vote. Because he, in his mind, he believed that if there was a delay, then magically somehow state legislatures would rescind their certification somehow. So he was actually taking actions during this attack that not only was not helping, uh, it was hurting. And I mean, Congressman Liu, that's a great point. Remember what you were doing that day. It was the most typically procedural pro forma thing that Congress does, which is 
And it's a, it's a day that we normally never speak about when it comes to elections. I teach election law. I don't talk very much about the day where Congress counts the certified votes. And that's what Congress was engaged in, counting certified results. Typically the vice president says, can I have the envelope? And he says, count it up. And then what happens? They count it up. He says, any objections, just like anybody who's been married, you know, speak now or forever, hold your peace. Nobody ever says anything as they don't in a, in a wedding ceremony either. And, and that's that. And so you were just um, doing your legal and constitutional duty. Now, um, Congresswoman Berrigan, you brought up uh, potential federal criminal charges. Could you talk to us a little bit more about the details of um, against who and, um, and what? We hear a lot of reporting, but not a lot of specifics. We just hear kind of potential federal criminal exposure. So um, who are we thinking about here? Well, first of all, I think, uh, you know, the, the concept that nobody is above the law applies to the president, and therefore we need to look at uh, including federal charges. Um, we probably are, are better off having a, a, a federal prosecutor uh, who might uh, better um, tell us under what sections uh, might be best uh, to, to, uh, to charge the president, but I think he's certainly one of them and certainly those who played a role in um, in the insurrection, you know, we're hearing reports, we don't know yet of, you know, possible members who gave tours, reconnaissance tours to some of these uh, rioters the night before. Um, I'll tell you if that happened, that uh, is, sounds to me like federal charges um, in, in, you know, playing a role in this. Um, and I, I know that there's other avenues that people have spoken about who financed this and uh, so I think there's a, a lot for federal prosecutors to look at, uh, but we can't just say, oh, this happened, let's let it go, or um, just let's just expel a member. No, we need to look at all avenues because nobody should be above the law, whether you're the president of the United States or you're a member of Congress or you know you were one of the rioters who, who's a, a citizen. Congressman Liu, did you wanna pick up on the potential federal charges um, before we move on to uh, my next bucket of questions. So I'll just focus uh, on the president for now. Uh, incitement to insurrection uh, is a felony. In addition, a police officer was murdered. And it's foreseeable that if you incite a mob to attack the Capitol and there's Capitol Police there, uh, they might just harm or murder a police officer, which means the president could also, in my opinion, as a former prosecutor, be charged with felony murder as well. So there's a number of different charges that could be leveled against the president uh, after January 20th. Uh, that's gonna be up to the uh, investigation and up to what the prosecutors do uh, with the facts once they find out what the investigation reveals. In fact, um, under the felony murder, statutes, couldn't you actually charge a number of people who were there and just participated in the activities, I think? Yes, you could. Uh, so some of those, um, I'm going to call them domestic terrorists, um, are going to be or potentially will be hit with more than just trespassing. Uh, they could have uh, some serious prison time facing them. Um, all right, we talked about basically we walked through all the constitutional provisions at issue here, the impeachment provision, the 25th Amendment, the 14th Amendment. We talked about federal charges a little bit, which I suspect will be forthcoming. Um, there's been a lot of questions about the pardon power. And I answered one of them very briefly. Um, the president does continue to have the power to pardon himself. Now, um, Congresswoman Berrigan, first to you, are you concerned in these next uh, five and a half, I'm not, my math might be wrong on exactly the moment that the inauguration is gonna occur, five and a half days, what we're gonna see with respect to the pardon power, or I can ask you if you want to do it more broadly, um, what are you most concerned about in the next five and a half days? 
Well, this president has shown that he's willing to pardon anybody who went to bat for him, committed a crime for him, who lied for him, um, even people who pled guilty. And so it's clearly a concern for me and many others I've spoken to, whether this president is going to pardon everybody and anybody who was part of the right um, on democracy, the right on the Capitol, and whether he's going to try to pardon himself. Um, and so there really should be a provision that says you can't pardon yourself and you can't pardon people that you uh, encourage to commit a crime and that you participated in, in some cases like this. So um, that is definitely a concern. Um, and one of the reasons I believe he should be removed before he has an opportunity to do that. Congressman Liu, under the um, list of things that is going to keep me up between now and January 20th, what's on your list? So right now, um, there are planned armed marches on 50 state capitals. Uh, you have a number of other um, plans that uh, you see circulating in sort of the right-wing militia sphere. And that's one reason Washington DC looks like a fortress right now with uh, 20,000 National Guard troops having to be deployed there. You've got 50 state capitals where they've increased security. All of this could be calmed down if Donald Trump simply said one sentence, the election was not stolen. He refuses to do that. The rage and violence that's fueling all this is his supporters wrongful belief that Donald Trump won the election by a landslide and that he should remain president for another four years. And Donald Trump needs to tell them that that's just not true, that he lost and Joe Biden legitimately won. If he would do that, he could calm down tensions uh, in a major way. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think he's going to do that, which is why we are all these troops deployed all over the place. Yeah, I mean, so many of us saw this picture of the National Guard sleeping in the Capitol on the floor. And that is, um, a, I think, a country that is unrecognizable to many of us, as is a country where uh, Congresswoman Berrigan is on a text chain about um, the bulletproof vest. And so that actually brings me to the next thing that I want to talk about, which is we started uh, with both of you sheltering in place in different places, but in the Capitol where you work as public servants. Um, that doesn't happen right away. I mean, we don't get to that place in America where it looks almost unrecognizable based on one rally. Um, so Congresswoman Berrigan, first to you, you know, how do we get to this place where you and I are on a Zoom and you're saying they told me to open up for security, but how can I trust with security? I mean, what are the little or big steps along the way? Well, the bottom line is it all points to lies. Lies that this president has said over the course of the last four years um, and actions that he's taken. It's his ability to divide people, to put hate out there, um, him convincing his supporters that the media is the bad guy, I don't believe them. Um, it's attacking the free press, it's attacking the FBI. Um, it has just been an ongoing campaign of his um, and these lies add up and people believe them. And I've talked to some of these people before and I gotta tell you, these are not just folks who don't have an education. Some of these are very, you know, lawyers at, at big law firms that I practiced in um, are believing the rhetoric and so this is a, 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 co a combination, a, a culmination, I can't, it's a better word, of years of inflammatory rhetoric by the president, um, his conspiracy theories and his lies is what got us here. Certainly that fire was fueled with the rally and him leading people to believe he was going to the Capitol. I think I saw part of the speech where he says, I'm going with you. And then you have his own lawyer uh, using words like com, you know, trial by combat. I mean, that's how we get here. Now, when you add on to that, our House colleagues uh, doing the bidding on the House floor and also telling people uh, to continue and march and that they're going to do their part on the House floor, um, you know, putting the symbol up uh, that we've seen uh, the Senator do, encouraging it. It's gotten us to this moment 
um, which is just one that I thought I would never see um, on our democracy and, and at the Capitol. Congressman Liu, you and I have, um, I've had the honor of talking to you about this a little bit as we say offline when we, in before times when we used to actually be able to break bread in person. And I heard you say tonight something very clearly and very important. You said words matter. And that's, I think, what Congresswoman Berrigan said as well. And so the same question to you really, which is, we don't get you as a member of Congress sprinting down five flights of stairs, drafting articles of impeachment with a congressman who has just lost his son 24 hours, 48 hours before with a one bad speech. Um, and I think Congresswoman Berrigan walked us through in a lot of ways what has happened. And I wondered if you wanted to um, add to how you think we got here. And then of course, I'm gonna ask you how do we, later we're gonna to pivot to how do we get out? Uh, so Congresswoman Barry is absolutely right uh, that uh, the lies are a big part of it, uh, but it's also uh, what the lies were about. Um, it's not like you were saying apple pie is actually made out of blueberries. Uh, he had very divisive lies um, and divisive rhetoric, right? He started his campaign saying that all Mexicans were rapists. Um, he talked about um, people from Africa as being from shithole countries. Uh, he told the Proud Boys uh, to stand by. He said there were fine people on both sides in Charlottesville. Uh, so there is a racial component to his rhetoric uh, that really sort of brought out a lot of their, not just the racist, but really the crazy conspiracy type folks. And an article came out today showing that a number of the domestic terrorists that showed up on January 6th were on the FBI terrorist watch list because they were white supremacists. Uh, they were um, in these uh, white militia groups. And the people that attacked the Capitol, by and large, were white. And so you can't sort of take away sort of, I think the racial component of this, of how we got here over four years. And hopefully with uh, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, we're gonna go to more normal times uh, and not have the very highest office in the land continue to put out actual racist statements or, or dog whistles. I mean, when Donald Trump was, you know, threatening people in the suburbs by saying, Cory Booker is somehow gonna mess up your suburbs, that's just a dog whistle. And you have these statements like that year after year. And when you have four years of this and Republicans enabling him and not a lot of pushback from his own party, then you end up a situation like January 6th. Um, yeah, and it's a remarkable that in everything we've said, this is just a personal observation. You know, We've talked a lot about the things that I think have gone wrong in our country. And um, of course we have two democratic members of Congress, which in part because uh, if you have representatives from California, the chances are you're gonna uh, speak with Democrats. In nowhere have we talked about policy. I mean, all of the criticisms that we have deal with rule of law, respect for the country, um, fear for your safety. And it, it is um, something that I've noticed that we've not in any place talked about our views on tax policy, environmental policy, immigration policy, uh, climate control, um, these, seem to me to be issues, and again, speaking only for myself, to be separated apart from any policy debates that you might have with your colleagues going forward. Um, so Congresswoman Berrigan, I would like to talk about how do we get back to a place where you can have policy debates with your colleagues going forward? How can we, it, you know, I wish I could say January 20th, new, you know, 1201, America, we are back. This grand experiment in self-governance is back. Um, how can we not just get back, but be better? Well, the sad part is that the racism in this country will not go away on January 20th. That's the underlying reality here. But we are gonna get a new president who's gonna try to unify us, who's gonna take a different approach, um, not divide, not have the hateful rhetoric. But we have to start by telling people, the American people, the truth. And we have to stop the lies and we have to stop the conspiracy theories and we have to stop all the divisiveness. So that's the first step. Now, 
I can tell you that in my four years in Congress, I have had plenty of conversations with my colleagues on the other side who wanted to say something, who wanted to act differently, but didn't for the fear of the president. So my hope is by removing him and having somebody there like Joe Biden, who has a history of being bipartisan and working across the aisle and having respect and friends, friendships um, with Republican members that we will move away from that. Uh, but make no mistake, the racism in our country will continue and we have to continue to work um, to resolve those underlying issues uh, that, that we have uh, had in this country for a very long time. And, and so it's gonna be a long road, but I think if we don't start by telling the truth, holding people accountable, um, including our elected officials, um, and rebuilding that trust, um, then we're gonna have a hard time. So we gotta start there. Um, Congressman Lou, we met in a much more quaint time, I think. Um, we, we met because I wrote a silly op-ed that said, uh, Congressman Lou, you're sending me so much mail, you're making my then boyfriend uh, jealous because you were running in a special election and you had a great sense of humor about it and you sent me a very nice message. How do we, same question, how do we get back to a place where you're having policy debates with your colleagues and you're not searching for um, bulletproof vests during floor debates? Right. So um, I'll recount a sort of funny story. I had a Republican member of Congress last term and then I think I'll try to give some words of hope. So last term I was talking to this moderate Republican member and she was no fan of Trump. And she said it to me, she said, I look forward to the days of when we can go back to just good old fashioned gridlock. And I thought it was sort of funny um, because everything had been so crazy uh, under Trump. <laughs> but I want folks to think about uh, sort of this thought that occurred to me uh, last year uh, when I went to Alabama um, with Congressman Lewis, he had done this yearly trip to Alabama um, and uh, we sort of walk uh, with him across the Edmund Pettus Bridge. Uh, and part of that trip, we go visit Rosa Parks Museum. And while I was there, it sort of struck me that Rosa Parks would not have been surprised by a President Donald Trump. That was her life experience was, you know, racism. That's what she grew up in. But she could never, ever have envisioned President Barack Obama. And he won office he stayed president for eight years, and she never would have envisioned Vice President Kamala Harris. I remember when my kids um, were watching the inauguration of uh, President Obama the first time, uh, they were too young to vote. Now on January 20th, when they watch Kamala Harris get sworn in, they're still too young to vote. So understand the progress we have made. The last four years, we somewhat went backwards, um, but we do, over time, continue to move, move forward uh, to a more perfect union. And I think there is still um, great hope for the United States and our best days are yet to come. Um, I'm so tempted to leave it on that note because that was such a perfect ending. Um, but I do want to quickly get through a couple of the questions. And Congressman Liu, I do thank you for that. And it is important to forgive the expression it is really important sometimes to zoom out and see how far we've actually come and to try and take a much more aerial view of where we are as a country. And um, it's hard to do sometimes because we have an onslaught, as Claudia said in the introduction, we have an onslaught of news oftentimes that is dispiriting and disparaging. And we got a couple of questions on this um, in Congresswoman Berrigan, I'll go to you first. This is one of my kind of new pet projects, I'll say. I'm going to roll a couple of questions into one. Um, we, campaigns of disinformation are not going to go away on January 20th. Um, I feel like the three of us could have a conversation, probably disagree on, again, on some policy issues, but we would all basically agree on what is an issue and all basically agree where we want to get, but just not how to get there. Um, we have a country where people are just reading from different scripts. How do you, how do we move forward from a place where 
I say that's a triangle and someone who lives across the street from me says, I see a circle. It's an unfair question, but how do we start to move forward from that? Well, that is very hard to do. I think the, the, the way that I have um, been able to do that more successfully, um, especially in Congress, and I think about this when I was a practicing lawyer, I got more done when I was friendly with opposing counsel than when I was just always fighting with them. And so having that relationship with the person um, is a good start. And I think that helps. Um, that's something that I've tried to do on the Hill um, uh, with my Republican colleagues. I'm one of two women who play on the congressional men's baseball team. Through that, I meet a lot of Republicans. Um, through that, I've been invited on Republican trips to Afghanistan and to tour the troops. So I, I really think it's, it's with that relationship and maybe starting with the people you know and have a relationship with, but it's not easy. I have tried to do it over the last four years and some people are stuck on where, what they're hearing and believe it. Other people are a little bit more open-minded. Um, we've gone from an era where we thought, you know, Fox was conveying the misinformation and now we have a new channel uh, called Newsmax I hear about. And I watched some of these interviews with some of my new colleagues and I, I'm just completely at a loss at how uh, we share the same space. So. It's, it's not gonna be easy. And, and Jessica, if you have any suggestions, I'm willing to, to listen to any of them um, because um, sometimes it does feel like you're talking to folks that just have blinders on. It's, it's not like you're talking to a lawyer who's trying to have a reason and you have, you talk about both sides and then you come down with a reason decision, like, which is what you do in law school. Um, so uh, I, I wish I had a better answer for you, but I've been trying to figure that out for for the last four years with some of my colleagues? Uh, my answer is that I've never been more confident that the Hammer audience would prefer to hear from Congressman Liu on this than me. Um, <laughs> I'm happy to speak to you anytime about this, but Congressman Liu, this, I know that you care deeply about this as well. Part of, I think, your note of optimism, your note of coming together, seems to me it has to be trying to get to a place where we're not in completely different information ecosystems. Are there ways that you would like to see us approach that? Is it, is it changing education? Is it legislation? Is it a combination? Um, is it too soon to give specific suggestions? Uh, so I agree, first of all, with everything that Congressman Barragan said. Um, I mean, who would have thought that you could have Newsmax make Fox News seem moderate? Right, but that's basically what's happening. Now, at the same time, uh, I thought what was very interesting uh, with their electoral college certification results, um, as well, not just the state legislatures, but also in, in Congress, um, everyone was being subjected, right, to the disinformation by Donald Trump uh, and by some of his enablers. But most Republican legislators rejected that. Right, that the electoral college count was not particularly close. Most people accepted the electoral college results, both at the state legislatures as well as in Congress. Uh, so you do actually have people listening to this information and then separating it out and saying that's just you know crap, that's just false, that's wrong. Um, it might be somewhat harder, right, for um, Trump's base, uh, but clearly people can look at facts and decide that's just BS. Um, I mean, when you right, have folks saying Hugo Chavez rose from the dead and had this great conspiracy to change you know, votes on voting machines, right? people will just reject that. Um, and then something else I think to think about is it does matter when the president of the United States is not the one leading with lies and conspiracy theories. So when you've got Joe Biden now, who's not going to make lies and have all these weird conspiracy theories, then I think it makes it harder to amplify uh, some of these crazy things to the American public. And I think that's another way to tamp down disinformation. And then finally, just consider that even with all this disinformation up to uh, the November elections, the American people, American people rose up and fired Donald Trump. And then they went ahead and gave Democrats control of the US Senate by sweeping Georgia. So clearly the American public is able to assess this information and it turns out 
they said, you know what, we're going to give you Democrats control of the House, the Senate, and the White House, because we can't tolerate another four more years of this craziness. Jessica, can I share a quick little story that, you know, sometimes I tell people about, um, you know, when I first got elected to Congress, the freshman class, I served as a, as a freshman class president, we would do events with the, with the, Dem, with the Republicans. And these were be policy sessions where we got together and we talked about policy totally off the record. Like we weren't gonna hold anybody accountable for anything. I was shocked at what I heard behind closed doors by some of my Republican colleagues. And I'll never forget this one particular story. Um, we were talking about immigration, just to give you an idea, very you know controversial. Um, we were talking about immigration and one of my colleagues said, you know, I love immigrants. To be honest with you, you know, I had somebody work in my house and I, I quickly learned that this person didn't have papers. And this was 10 years ago. I went down to my local pastor and said, what can I do? And that was, you know, this was like 15 years ago, uh, said, give me a thousand dollars and we'll fix it. And this member is telling me the story like, that I'm kind of shocked that is being repeated, he gives the money over and the papers get fixed. And he goes, and I've gone on to support and love this family and uh, you know, this person has had two children and they're now American citizens. And I said, I said, that's an amazing story that you were helpful, that you have people that you understand their value and what they bring to this country. How can you can't share that story? And the answer I got was, I couldn't do it. If people in my district knew about this, I wouldn't be able to get elected. And so we've had policy conversations and we've had people tell us behind closed doors, I want to do this. I share your view, but I can't do it because of politics. And so I think the big question is, how do we, how do we get from there to actually getting some common ground to move forward on, on positive change for the country? Because that's what it's about. So it's, um, it's, it's a challenge because you do hear some of these stories behind closed doors on policy and, and you just feel kind of heartbroken about it. Um. There have been a number of questions on, I think that we should um, we should do two more kind of sets of questions, if that's okay. Um, everybody, we're obviously, I think there was about at its height 54 questions that came through. I've been doing my best to try and consolidate and get everybody's answers. Um, I feel like I'm having a little deja vu from what I said to my students this morning when class time was running out. Uh, there have been a couple of questions about the pardon power. And some, let's end with, I think, the questions about um, the latest information on the mob. So first about the pardon power. Um, Congressman Liu, is a self-pardon constitutional and do you expect one? Um, I've not seen a legitimate constitutional scholar basically say, yes, the president can self-pardon himself. And I don't believe that the constitution would allow that and the Supreme Court has, in the past, said that no one is above the law, including the president. If the president actually has self-pardon power, then that would mean the president uh, was above the law. Um, clearly, Nixon didn't think he had self-pardon power, right? He would have executed it if he, if he thought he had that. So um, I don't think uh, that constitutionally the president has it. And also, um, I think politically, it would actually be worse if Trump tried it, because then I think um, it makes it even more glaring obvious that he committed a crime because you wouldn't do this if you didn't thought you committed a crime. And you can't just sort of generally vaguely pardon yourself for whatever you did for the last four years. You have to be specific in what it is you're trying to pardon. Um, yes, and I, I should have laid the groundwork a little bit. A presidential pardon, of course, only affects federal crimes. It can't affect state crimes. There are ongoing state investigations in not new just New York, but also in Georgia. It feels like 200,000 years ago, I think it was nine or 10 days ago, that the information about the phone call between President Trump and the Secretary of State of Georgia came out, which in my view, and in my view alone, amounts to election fraud. Um, and we of course have never had, we don't have an answer. The reason I asked Congressman Liu this question is because we don't have an answer. We have never had a president try to self party before. And um, the best argument in favor of it, I think, is that it doesn't specifically say you can't. The best arguments against it are exactly what Congressman Lewis said, which is we have this bedrock principle 
no person is above the law. No person can be a judge in their own case. There's this idea of democratic self-governance, uh, accountability. Um, Congresswoman Berrigan, there's been also questions when it comes to the pardon power. Um, maybe President Trump can get a get out of jail free card if he resigns sometime around dinner on January 19th. Um, and then Vice President Pence has nothing to do but talk to the pardon attorneys until uh, noon on January 20th. Is that a possibility that is you think seriously being discussed? Uh, is that something we should be worried about? Well, I think that the president has all options on the table. And I think if he could get Pence to do what he definitely would, I would hope that the vice president, after being uh, basically called out by this president and put out for the, the mobs to come in and basically get him and, and try to find him and, and kill him would, would uh, hamper, convince him that it's not the right thing to do. Now, I also wonder uh, whether if he tried to do that, um, whether it's gonna be a specific enough charge or whether what if the charge comes after he leaves office, this investigation is still ongoing. You, I'm, I'm not aware of being able to pardon something, you, you know, some charge that hasn't been, hasn't been levied yet. So um, I, I don't rule anything out with this president because I do believe that he thinks he's above the law and he has acted in the last four years um, in a way of saying to everybody, I'm going to do what I want. Somebody stop me. And so I, I do think that he's probably having the conversation about whether he can do that. Um, I hope that the vice president will not entertain it. Uh, Congressman Liu, there have been a couple last uh, pardon power question. Um, of course, you can preemptively pardon. See, for example, President uh, Ford pardoning President Nixon. Um, another potential preemptive pardon would be, as Congresswoman Berrigan said, uh, President Trump seems to like to use the pardon power to reward, she didn't use these words, but essentially reward loyalists. Um, the insurrectionists have been very loyal to President Trump. Are we worried about seeing a pardon for the people who stormed the Capitol and I think in the, our minds attempted a coup of the government on January 6th? Uh, we've seen in the last four years that ultimately Donald Trump is all about himself. And I think if he views uh, that action as increasing his chances of conviction in the U.S. Senate, he won't do it. And I think that probably would. I mean, if you went ahead and try to pardon these people that literally try to hunt down U.S. senators, I think it would make it more likely that more U.S. senators might vote for conviction. So I don't think Trump would actually pardon them. Um, not because he doesn't want to, but because out of self-interest, he believes it would harm him. Um, Congresswoman Berrigan, last question is, there's a lot of people asking variations on um, something I touched on briefly, but what's the latest information we have on the people who stormed the Capitol? Do we know, or do we have any reports that members of Congress gave them tours beforehand, showed them this is the best. Uh, this is the best entrance if you want to get through this way. Um, lots of information floating around. Can you let us know where we are right now? Well, the latest that I have heard from my colleagues is that uh, one of our colleagues did see um, a member giving what she believed to be a reconnaissance tour the day before, on January the fifth. And she was so disturbed by it because there are no tours right now. A member of Congress is not supposed to give a tour to anybody um, of the Capitol right now. And was so disturbed that she reported it to the Sergeant of Arms on January the 5th. So this is something new we didn't know about. Um, we do know that the FBI has been working uh, as diligently as they can with the digital images. We've posted some of them as well. Uh, they've made, I understand, over a hundred arrests and they are still looking for more people. Um, Although we do know, uh, unfortunately, one of my colleagues who is in charge of oversight of the Capitol Police have not been able to get as much information as we've been asking for. So I think there's still a lot that we don't know um, and it's gonna take some time to get that information, uh, but we certainly need to get all the facts so we know who was involved uh, because anybody was involved that helped incite this insurrection needs to be accountable. I firmly believe that. 
Um, and so we will get to the bottom of it. Um, I want to be mindful of your time. This has been, I, I have been so honored to be part of this conversation. I've been so honored to um, spend this time with you and to spend the evening with you. And um, I want to go to both of you for just, is there anything else you want to say to an active and alert and engaged group like we have in the Hammer audience? Is there anything that you hope, you know, I hope this is what you take away and I hope that this is what we do going forward. Uh, Congressman Lou, first to you. So I just want to say what an honor uh, it has been to be on this panel uh, with Congresswoman Barragon and also uh, with uh, you, Professor Levinson. And I just want people to sort of step back a little bit um, and not just on the events of this week, but sort of look overall at what happened in the last four years. Um, Donald Trump came in with Republican control of the House, the Senate, and the White House. He is leaving with Democratic control of the House, the Senate, and the White House um, because the American people self-corrected. Uh, after two years, uh, they flipped the House. After four years, they flipped the Senate and the White House. And I think uh, our democracy is still strong and robust. And I'll uh, leave with this uh, one additional thought. Uh, regardless of what you thought about the Mueller report, at the end of the day, it was a Republican who led that report, Robert Mueller, in a Republican Department of Justice while the country was controlled by Republicans in the House, Senate, and White House. And that report was allowed to go through to its completion. That's pretty remarkable. I don't think most countries would have allowed that to have, have happened. You could disagree with you know, whether or not Congress should have acted uh, on that report for, for impeaching Trump, but that report did come out and the American people did read it. And so I think even though our democracy was tested these last four years, uh, it did survive and it's going to continue. Um, and at the end of the day, uh, we kept our republic. Congresswoman Berrigan. Well, I just want to thank you for inviting me and being part of this conversation. Um, you know, my path to becoming a member of Congress was um, was very challenging. And so just to be able to every day walk into the Capitol and serve the people of the 44th District, and for me, I see it as a much greater responsibility of, of, of people across the entire country. Um, and so it's just really an honor for me to be part of the conversation. And just to remind folks out there, uh, we hear this all the time from the speaker that public sentiment is everything. And so the engagement that we have from the public, all of you who are um, joining us tonight is so very important. Whether you're writing letters to the editor, whether you're writing an op-ed, whether you're writing to your member of Congress and having your voice heard or you're peacefully uh, marching and protesting, that sways public opinion and that sways policy and it sways members of Congress. So continue to do that. Reach out to your friends in different parts of the country and your family members um, to share your views and what you think. And, and when you see something that you don't like to have your voice heard, um, because it does move the needle um, in Washington and it shapes our policy more than you think. And so please continue to do that. Um, and thank you for having this conversation that I never thought we would be having to have. Um, my old friend, Congressman Liu, my new friend, Congressman Berrigan, thank you, truly a privilege. And um, I'm gonna let Claudia, the Director of Public Programs, thank you on behalf of the UCLA Hammer. Thanks, I just wanna say it's really been an honor to have both of you here. So on behalf of the Hammer Museum and UCLA and the people of California, I wanna thank you for being here and thank you for your service. And I wish you both the greatest safety in the months to come. Thank you. All right, with that, um, Hammer Forum, please play us off. And um, Congressman Liu, thank you so much. Congressman Berrigan, really thank you so much. You are welcome to uh, sign off and uh, with our deepest gratitude. So we wish you a good night. Thank you.